Young and a lot of shows that we were organizing last night, if you were there last night, a lot of noise, a lot of fun, but as you can tell, it's taking the toll, but I'll do my best. Um, so thank you everyone, uh, my name is Sam, I'm glad to be here. I'll be talking to you about using a project-based learning, specifically Game with Robots, to help people learn about code and computer systems in a directed and scaffolded way. So, start off with, I want to tell you about myself, because I'll be sharing my journey through this as someone who is uh, not a hardware or software engineer, so this is a personal experience that I had. Um, I'm actually a chemist and a researcher and an educator, so I look at things through an educator lens. And I think about pedagogy a lot, so a part of this project I was doing this, I was thinking a lot about the way it might affect others and the way it could be translated to a teaching tool. Um, so, but I still have an amateur interest in all of these systems, like everyone I think, in some level, loves to be a little bit of everything. Everyone wants to build cool robots. Everyone wants to do program cool servers. It just might seem a little daunting for some of us. Um, so I'm hoping that, again, this will provide some insight into ways that can be more accessible. So I'm going to take you through my experience of how projects can be an example and a tool for others. So first, I'm going to talk about why this project specifically. So I'm going to tell you about the uh, genesis of this project. So my friends and I, we enjoy board games because we're giant nerds, but that's no surprise to anyone here, probably. Specifically, we enjoyed playing this one game called Robo Rally one night, which is about programming robots by playing cards and moving your little plastic robots around a board. That's cool and all, but we thought to ourselves, what if it used actual robots, right? And I'm sure everyone's been sitting around having a few drinks and you have this thought about, what if we did it with this way, did our technology in that way? And so a project, can be anything you want to be. It can be that really like, crazy idea you have after a few drinks and hanging out with friends about, what if we did this really cool thing that is just there's something that excites you? And so this project was a great excuse for us to get into learning robotics. We had been going to maker fairs for a year or two. We'd been exploring microcontrollers, but we didn't really have any purpose to them. We hadn't used them for anything yet because we sort of played around with that, made the lights blink, and then you know, we were like, what do we do now? So this was an excellent excuse to get a more deep dive and a focused way into uh, these projects. And that's how RoboRuckus was born. So I'm going to go through the general design here. Um, and this is part of the learning process. So when you try to do a project-based learning, you want to break it down into discrete steps. So something like build a robot game is a huge concept that, you know, when someone just hears that, they're like, that, well, I don't know how to do that. That is crazy. But once you start breaking it down into manageable subspieces, you can start focusing and doing one step at a time, always with that larger goal in mind, which can help keep you directed and motivated on your process. So we decided there would be two general parts. Oh, my LibreOffice does not like this part of my slide. That's fine. Um, there will be the robots, and the robots would be open sourced. Uh, we wanted to be flexible and extensible, so Arduino based was the idea because that was very popular at the time, had a lot of community support, and I thought that'd be the easiest way for everyone to get involved. We also then wanted to have the game controller software, which would be a web-based interface, because we wanted to be something that didn't need specific hardware or software requirements. It was uh, platform agnostic and easy to deploy. All you need is a web browser and something that can you know, hook up to the web server you're running, and that way anything can join into it. And web technologies are very popular and very flexible, so if you're gonna learn a skill, you know, web development is a very profitable skill in many ways, and we thought that was a good place to be. All right, so one of our main theses for this project, we want everything to be as simple and inexpensive as possible. This was a hobby for us. We didn't want to spend thousands of dollars on big fancy robots or big you know, server racks and server time. So this is our lowest common denominator solution. Not to say that projects can't be big and complicated, but we want to make this one an entry level thing. All right. So this, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the server code itself, but again, I want to show you how you break up a project into discrete pieces for us. Because um, we thought about this not in terms of code, but in terms of what we want the project to do. We wanted a project, we have to have something that calculates the movement of the robot. So as the robots are moved around the game board, something that can move them and know where they should be, and are they following the rules and logic of the game. We need some kind of user interface and ways for users to interact with the game. And we needed some way for cards to be dealt to the players so they could play their moves and get the cards. And we had to have a way for the robots to interface with the game. So this was the idea, again, of taking a project and you break it down into parts, server code, robot code, and then break those down to further discrete steps until everything is manageable. It doesn't seem like an insurmountable task anymore. Oh, you need to make a single user interface. 
great, you've done it. Now you need to make another one that does a different interface. But those are all small tasks, you know, single step processes, baby steps that help you bootstrap your project. So if you want to get into more of the technical details, like you really get in the nitty gritty I can talk about it for hours, come talk to us upstairs. We have the game and the robots running. I'm happy to go into all the nitty gritty there. I don't think I want to waste all your time in the next 15 minutes that I have left here, so I'm just going to gloss over that. So some examples of user interface. Again, project-based learning can take you to places you didn't know you would go. When I started this project, I didn't think to myself, I'm going to make web-based touch user interfaces. But when it came time to make a user interface, that seemed the most logical way. How do you want to interact with the game? We didn't want to have mouse and pointer only because we want to be able to, be able to play it on their phones or tablets or whatever. So we had to learn how to do touch interfaces. And so these are some examples of interfaces we made that when I started this project, didn't know I was going to be doing that, but now I've acquired that skill and learned that ability that I can take forward to other projects or other ventures. Um, you can see there's lots of different examples from maps to simple sliders, things that are basic. Like these are things that every entry level web developer knows, but that were novel to me, and this was my way to learn these things that had a purpose for them. So we had a couple phases for the robots. Our phase one, again, keeping it simple, was to have um, a custom-made robots as there weren't as many kits available at prices that we would find acceptable back in 2015 when we started this project. Um, this also was an excellent excuse to be a good learning experience, right? So some people want to learn one part of something, some people want to learn another part of something, but for us, saying, okay, let's build these custom was a hurdle we gave ourselves on purpose, a project we gave ourselves to really learn in depth how the robots work and to get a good understanding of robotics. Um, here's the robot program again. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but that just shows you again how you can break things down to discrete steps. And these aren't necessarily code flows. This is just you know saying to myself, I want the robots to do this, and I can worry about how to do that in code later once I understand what each discrete uh, process is going to be. And that really helps me contextualize the code I'm writing, not just sitting there writing code now I have a reason to write the code to find out what do I need to learn to write the code that accomplishes you know, the sending an IP address to the game server that the robot has or something like that. So it gives you a specific task in mind to help focus what you're going to learn and how to find the information you need. So our robots are stateless. We want to make them simple. Um, they don't rely on any information from the server. They're just told to do something, they do it, and then they're done. They don't know where they are or what's going on. And that was, again, to simplify things and offload all the heavy stuff to the server we would have to worry about like an app mega not being able to process a command or any kind of like, so again, the robots can be very simple and inexpensive. Um, they, you know, again, very simple ones, this is linear movement. They have servos or motors, and you try to match the wheel speeds and hope they can drive straight. <laughs> not always. <laughs> it is, yeah, so it doesn't always work. We also have some integrated gyroscopes that are ubiquitous now on these devices that try to help them keep them straight, and again, there are ways to do movement much more sophisticated than this, but this is the very simplest way that I understand I can make motors move, that's a good place to start. Now, if you want to do LiDAR or sonar or other kind of like computer vision stuff, you can do that. But that's like you start at one place and you use that as a stepping stone to get to those more complicated movement pieces. Um, oh, going backwards. So on the turning movement, again, just using gyroscopes to try to get them to turn approximately 90 degrees. Is it perfect? No, but is it good enough to be a rewarding experience? Absolutely. So, oh, leave it off. It's not in my videos. That's fine. Um, I'm going to quickly uh, turn that down. Uh, so, this was our first prototype. You can see hand built. Uh, that was a mistake. Not in the sense that it wasn't a successful project, but man, I never wanted to hand build a circuit that complicated again in my life. So, we'll get to that. But, Again, as a learning experience, it was invaluable to learn, like, hey, these are how the connections all flow. I know every connection goes. So if I want to then take it to the next level, I have that fundamental understanding by starting at, you know, step by step on the project. It was also extremely satisfying to see this robot move. And it didn't drive straight. It crashed into the wall. If I tried to show you the whole video, you would see it veer off and crash into a wall there. But even with all its mediocrity, it was still extremely satisfying and gratifying to have built something that actually moved when I told it to move. So, it's giving those little rewards every step of the way that keep you going. Instead of having to, like months and months until you have a product, a result, you have all these little results because you have all these little digestible pieces and every little success is a little hit of that endorphin that keeps you wanting to do more. All right, let's see if I can, nope, don't play the video again. So next step after having hands on everything was do a PCB design. I never thought I'd design a PCB in my life. Never thought I'd have to do it. Mm -hmm. Seemed complicated and impossible to do. 
But again, after having the experience of wiring one up, I thought, I don't want to do that again, so what's my option? And so luckily there's free software out there you can use to design PCBs. There are fab houses that you can order small batch PCBs from. So again, learning new things along the way because the project directs you to these places you didn't think you would go based on what your needs are. Uh, so again, assembly is a good time because you can get your friends together, you can teach them new skills like soldering, you can, you know, build your, uh, your whole fleet of robots. And they look like jank because they're made of hot glue and prayers to hold them together. But, you know, they work, they're fun, and it's, you have a good time having some strictly non-alcoholic beverages while soldering and uh, uh, putting things together for an afternoon and learning a new skill. It's a really uh, satisfying experience because you can do a project with people. It can be a group activity. It can be something that you all do to support each other. So it can be really fun and involved in a way, again, to keep you motivated if you have other people helping you along the way, it's not just yourself. Because I have trouble, if it's just me keeping myself motivated, then I'm, ex now I'm accountable to someone else. So that helps. So next step was to make it a little bit less jank by doing 3D printing. And again, 3D printing was starting to get popular in 2016, 2017, so it should be more affordable. And so it was another opportunity to learn a new skill, 3D printing and, and 3D modeling, but using the same project to keep us focused on how we're going to use that skill. And not just buy a 3D printer and you know, print a benchy and you're like, okay, what now? Well, here's a goal we have now to keep us focused. And so we had a successful boxy robot. Is it pretty? No. Could it use some curves? Sure. But damn it, it works. So I can't really complain that hard about it. We also decided to add live poly battery supplies, which again, learning about power supplies, things like boost circuits and current limiting and all that kind of stuff is a part you want to learn because we don't want to keep changing AA batteries all the time. That was a real pain in the butt. Uh, so the board design process, again, a video that LibreOffice doesn't like, that's okay. I'm not going to hold it against it. I appreciate uh, free open source software. So, <laughs> so our first iteration of the board, we were using uh, magnetic line following. So magnets beneath the board that the robot would try to follow using a magnetometer. This turned out to be a pretty interesting way. You can see we started out with this strip and then embedding the magnets into the board itself and the board would move and we'd play a vinyl mat over the top of it. That would then be used to uh, play the game. The robot would try to follow the magnetic field beneath the board. That worked pretty well, but it turned out to be a little bit more expensive and finicky than we wanted to do. So when we thought about a second iteration, uh, we'll get to in a moment, we want to simplify it. But just to sort of pause for a moment and show you that first version, that you know, alpha point zero 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 whatever version you have there, it looks pretty cool, right? It's something that we made. You can take a picture of it. It has an interface. It all works. Is it perfect? No, do the robots wander off course more often than they go the way you want them to go? Yes, but it's fun, and we made it, and that is very satisfying. So even though the project itself wasn't finished, you still have something to show for your work along the way. So going to uh, phase two, there are all these new robot kits now available here in the uh, year of 2023 that are inexpensive, you know, 20 to $50, depending on the kit you want. There are microcontrollers that are easy to get a hold of. Um, they're better supported by the community and libraries provided by manufacturers and chip developers. And they have all different kinds of ways to program them now, not just, you know, through Arduino. You can also do things like make code or, let's, or, or like scratch-based drag-and-drop blocks or MicroPython or CircuitPython or whatever language you want to use, .NET, Nano Framework, all that kind of stuff. So there's all these options now that weren't available. So it's a really excellent way to expand it and make it even easier for people to get involved. The parts are also more modular now. So if you want to servo from one robot to another, you can easily swap them out and sort of get a generalized sense of how things work. So again, some videos that don't always work, but here's an example, you can kind of see squeeze in the corner there, of the robots driving and navigating, and they move in different ways. So you have two different robots that have two different means of turning. For instance, one has to do a little rocking motion because it's too big, and one has to do a little spin. And it's just really nice to see uh, how everything works when it's uh, fully assembled and put together. So new robot design give us a lot of options. They allow to be any robot you want. You can use any kind of microcontroller, any programming language, different movement options. You can use wheels, you can use linear movement, you can use walkers or omni wheels, whatever you want as long as it can move in a linear direction and then make turns. So this really gives a lot of flexibility to explore different robots with a purpose. So if you want to build a walker robot, well here's a way you can build a walker robot to a certain set of constraints that give you a focused purpose for how you're going to use that walker robot or a treaded robot or an omni wheel robot. 
uh, and how you want to navigate them. Do you want to use gyroscopes and linear movement? Do you want to use rotary encoders or stepper motors? Do you want to use GPS or sonar or LiDAR? I don't know, but the options are out there for any type of navigation you want. Also communication options. We use Wi-Fi and, and mostly to communicate with our game server, but you can use Bluetooth or logo radios, whatever you want. So again, it allows you to take this project and figure out, okay, how am I going to adapt it now to this modularity or this modality or whatever you want to do. And all you have to remember is as long as you can speak the API, it's going to work. Um, so, for instance, upstairs we have a new way of doing the board. Instead of having a physical game mat, we have a projector that projects the game mat onto a surface so you can change it up on the fly without having to print out new game mats. So, all these new ways of doing things that we never would have thought of, but now that we have a project, we can think of ways to improve that project and think of ways to direct our focus and our attention. So, just to summarize project-based learning, you've heard my experience. I want to tell you why I think this project-based learning is an excellent tool. Now, to be clear, it's not the only tool. There are many ways to learn. But I find for me personally and a lot of my students, when I'm teaching them complicated abstract subjects, having a project is help. helps because it provides a goal. It tells them why they are doing something. You are not just learning a for loop to learn a for loop. You're learning a for loop because you need to count the number of spaces your robot has moved so that it moves the right number of spaces. If you have a physical, tangible result you are trying to achieve, and you can see that in real life, and it gives that that code, that, co that, that construct, a, a, a context that helps you remember it and know what is it for. It's not just a for loop, it does something. It gives you a natural step-by-step -step process. As I've gone through here, you've heard about the steps we had to follow, and I haven't gone through all of them, but the idea is you start at one point, you break it down to smaller and smaller pieces, because you know I'm trying to reach this end goal, but I can start here, and I always have that end goal in mind. I can break up different steps, and I always know I'm moving towards a specific end point. It also gives you multiple aspects to focus on. If you're interested in doing server back-end coding stuff, there's the game server that runs all that stuff. And web interfaces on, you could do that. If you want to do robots and tuning the hardware, you can do that. So it gives you whatever part you're most interested in. It gives you a scaffold to focus on that particular part you want, but also gives you a purpose for that skill. If you want to learn how to do JSON API communications, Here's a reason to do that, and you can learn by example and by having a set of parameters that you can, okay, I can achieve this, now I understand how it works, I can then take that forward with me to whatever other process I want. You also get natural community support. I mentioned that projects are done best with groups. You start the project, you get more people involved in that project, now it's not just you alone, when you get stuck, when you hit a roadblock, you can find someone else who's like, oh yeah, I had that same problem, I solved it, here's how I would do it. Or you can brainstorm together, try to solve it together. It helps keep people from abandoning projects or you know, hitting a roadblock and saying, well, that's, I, I don't have time to figure that out. I'm going to get back to that later, and you never do. And again, the most important thing I want to emphasize so much is tangible results. Every time I held a robot that we had made in my hand that was working, that was just that like endorphin rush of I like I birthed this, you know. Not to say that is like actual childbirth, but I imagine that it has a similar sort of satisfaction. <laughs> Obviously very different, but it is still something that's very rewarding. To have something you actually made that you can touch, that you can see, that you can like say show it off to your friends, it is rewarding and that keeps you motivated. And also scale by complexity, right? So you can start with a very simple version of just playing the game, how the robots move. You can start very basic, like make your robot drive forward and backwards. Or you can get really deep into all the back end stuff and fine tuning your complex robot or complex server environment, however you want to do it. So it really allows you to set the complexity level you want and also will scale with you. As you learn more and more and want to get more and more complex, you can get to more and more complex parts of the project. And so you don't have to like, find a new project for every time you want to learn a new skill. So just to give it a quick comparison to what's out there right now, um, there exist family projects and home kits. You can buy robot kits from Amazon, things like that. There are kits that use in educational offices, uh, educational classrooms, and you know for STEM projects. And there are also sister projects. We've seen a Lego version of the same robot project that someone made completely independently, convergent evolution. Uh, I guess many minds have great ideas, right? The reason that uh, we like our project, uh, hopefully, it is because, uh, one, it's a structured game. So these uh, kits you buy off Amazon, you buy a robot, you make it do a line following thing, your kids play with it a little bit, it drives around a few times, and then they're like, okay, what now? Right, what do I do with it? If you have the game already, the game is the fun part, right? So you're building the robot not just to build the robot, you're building the robot because you can then play with it and have fun with it, and it does something so it has a purpose. 
So it's a fun on its own. It's not just the robot building that's interesting. It's also just playing with the robots once they're assembled. It's flexible. So again, it scales to money, cost, complexity, however much you want to spend, however much you want to get deep into it. It allows you to find your level. And it can be integrated into school curricula. You can imagine a classroom where a bunch of students all build their own robot and then play the game at the end of the semester in a competition or something like that. Again, it gives them a goal to work towards. And there are other robot competitions out there. This is not a new idea, but it's just another way that is less competition necessarily organized and more about game, gamifying the process. Um, so, and also it's relatively inexpensive compared to thousands of dollars of, uh, of Legos. So, um, as cool as that project is, I don't, have, I don't have that kind of money, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I do love that project. So what we've done is we've taken it to colleges at the Megar Evers College Science Expo. We've taken it to gaming conventions at the Origins Game Fair in Columbus, Ohio. We've taken it to Maker Fairs, both the World Maker Fair in New York and the Maker Fair here in Bellingham. And uh, we've gotten Editor's Choice Awards for our work at the Maker Fairs, along with a feature in Make Magazine, which is, say, again, extremely gratifying. But what's the best part about that is we've gotten to the point where now we can share it and get more people involved and the fact that you know, people can see the value of this project. So most importantly, you want people to get involved. This isn't just us. Remember, project-based learning is best when it's done in the community. So you can get involved any way you want to. You want to expand the server, add new kinds of robots, refine our existing robots. All skill levels are welcome. <coughs> most importantly, we want you to have fun. So you can find our information, uh, maybe, there we go, at our website, roboruckus.com. We also partnered with Cascade Steam, which is a nonprofit here in Bellingham that does STEM outreach, or I should say STEAM outreach. So you can find us on their Discord server, and we'd love to have you get involved. We're always happy to bring new people in, wherever your skill level is, however you want to get involved, and whatever aspect of the project, you know, the more the merrier. And so I'll give everyone a check and take a picture of that if they want to. And then uh, I'll be checking out our demo upstairs. If you want to see it operating in real time, we'll be here until the closing of the day, until they kick us out, pretty much. And we'll try as soon as possible. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yes, yeah, so again, this is web technology, so you can install the game server on a cloud instance and then have people connect over the internet to that and have the robots connect over the internet to that and have robots in different places all moving, like, like a remote play chess kind of thing or chess by mail, uh, if you can emulate all that. So that is, a, a, again, it's as extensible and as creative as you want to get with it. You can do whatever kind of weird shenanigans you want. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, again, I mean, I would be very interested to, hear, to have someone, you know, sniff my packets <laughs> <laughs> to see what kind of, like, you know, again, we're using standard libraries. You don't know what those libraries are doing behind the scenes. This would be a great excuse. You already know what it's supposed to be doing. So comparing the packets you gather through a packet sniffing project to what you think should be happening would be an excellent way to figure out and, and hone your skills in packet identification. I learn a lot more than you expect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's the server run on? Oh, so uh, the server code is ASP.NET, so C Sharp, uh, multi-platform. We have it running on Raspberry Pis. You can run it on Linux environments. Uh, we want to Dockerize it at some point. Lots of things we want to do with it. Um, again, the server code is also arbitrary. As long as you can write it whenever you want, as long as it can follow the same game logic and has the same API interface with the robots that it needs. Likewise, the robots are, uh, are Arduino-based, but again, whatever code you want to use, whatever platform you want to use as long as it has the right responses to the API. I know this is Linux Fest, so we do use Raspberry Pis. There's Linux involved, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> all right, are there any other questions? I know it's getting late and we're all hungry. No? All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. <laughs>